right, we're back for the attack. It's another episode of the Paperback Warrior podcast. It's really great to be on for another edition of the show. I'm your co-host, Eric, and I'm going to be bringing my astute colleague, Tom, on in just a moment. Thanks for listening to the show thus far. We've gained a lot of subscribers and a lot of support as the weeks march on. And speaking for Tom and myself, man, we just couldn't be happier. It's been a, uh, it's been a great ride so far. Last week... We explored William Ard's You'll Get Yours, which uh, is a Black Gat book uh, out of the uh, Starkhouse Press. Uh, They do a really great job with their stuff. Uh, We did You'll Get Yours, and we also did uh, the new Manhunt magazine compilation from Starkhouse uh, and The Man from War, and Tom took care of the whole Man from Uncle influence on literature. That was a lot of fun. Uh, Be sure to go back and listen to that podcast if you haven't already. You're going to find us everywhere that you can listen to podcasts. Uh, We're pretty much everywhere. Uh, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any new content. We've got new episodes every single Monday, uh, so be on the lookout for that. Subscribe to whichever uh, whichever service you're using. Uh, Paperback Warrior had the recent opportunity to be featured in Men of Violence magazine. How about that for a name? We've got a number of reviews, including series entries like McHugh, John Marshall, uh, Stark. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, Penetrator. And we have a handful of quality standalone title reviews in there as well. Uh, Overall, the magazine features 100 plus reviews from quality writers and authors and focuses on our meat and potatoes palette, that 1960s and 1970s men's action adventure that we we love. Justin Marriott, uh, he's the creator, he's the editor, he's the owner, he does it all, and he runs a number of these paperback editorials. Uh, This guy's doing a uh, Hot Lead, which is a Western uh, magazine. He does the Sleazy Reader. I love that title. He does the Paperback Fanatic. Uh, Justin's even got a... I think he's got a horror one in there, too, that he does. Uh, but uh, Justin's been a great supporter of Paperback Warrior, and we love him, and we love his dedication to the genre. Uh, head over to Amazon, search for Men of Violence, and grab a hard copy for just six bucks. It's going to be money well spent. All right, so that's enough of my solo venture. Let's bring on Tom to see what's in store for us today. All right, so let's talk about the forecast for today. Eric's going to review another Chet Cunningham novel. Uh, we reviewed his Penetrator book called Man Kills, Man Kills Sport on our first episode. Uh, Eric's looking at a, a, one of Cunningham's executioner titles called Baltimore Trackdown. I am reviewing... What am I reviewing? I had a note here. I am reviewing... Oh, the uh, one of the newer episodes of The Gunsmith. Uh, Gunsmith number 446, Deadville, which is uh, by Robert Randizzi, writing as J.R. Roberts. And um, want to talk... Sounds, that sounds like a lot of fun. Deadville. It, Deadville. It's a good one. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, spoiler alert. It's a good one. Uh, before we get to that, I want to talk about some um, feedback we got from listeners. Um in our second episode, we talked about the birth of the paperback in 1939 and, and the paperback original in 1949, and basically the pinnacle of early paperback publishers, including a Fawcett Gold Medal. In that segment, we asked ourselves and our listeners what ultimately happened to the publisher. Uh, we had one listener named Tim who had the skinny. He responded that, um, that CBS, uh, we all know CBS, purchased the publisher and then eventually closed up shop of the publisher, Fawcett Gold Medal, due to poor sales. Uh, not a real revelation there. Uh, we knew the publisher had closed up shop in the 80s, but we were unaware of the particulars of that company's demise. So uh, thank you for sharing that tidbit with us. It's something I meant to uh, to mention to you earlier when you got here. Uh, Tom's been here for about an hour or so. Um, but we, uh, I found a copy of that Ed Gorman, Wolf's Moon. Okay. It's 1993 Fawcett. Really? They were still around in 93? Yeah, it's a 93 Fawcett gold medal. That's crazy, because I knew they were in the 80s, because some of the big, fat Matt Helm books were still by them, but they must have just been uh, dying on the vine <laughs> at that point. Maybe you have the last Fawcett gold medal book in your collection. I don't know. That's All crazy. Right. Should I go on to this next irritating one? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. All right. All right, so Eric is the boss here, and, uh, and so Eric fielded a correction uh, from a listener and uh, I, I did not field it, but I suspect it went it went something like this. Um, D- dear sirs, I, I I believe in the last episode when you were discussing Jonathan Craig that you indicated that he authored a book called The Case of the Vengeful Virgin. In fact, I believe that The Vengeful Virgin was a book by um, Gil Brewer and the... Jonathan Craig book is the case of the laughing virgin. I hope you will make that abundantly clear on your next podcast. So, okay, listener, 
the, uh, the well, actually guy. I'm glad you're listening. And I hope you feel triumphant in your uh, hoarder house, wearing your rubber pants, bouncing up and down on your mattress that <laughs> probably looks like a used coffee filter. I, you've corrected my error, and I'm so, so sorry I got this wrong. And you are the hero of this story. I hope you can find it in your, your heart to forgive me. We can, we can now go back to being the most factually accurate podcast in all 52 states. So thank you so much for bringing that to my attention, uh, Will Actually Guy. How did that make you feel? Oh, I'm just glad I got that off my chest. You know I love complaints. Please just bring them on. Anyone else who has complaints, they could please just email them to paperbackwarrior at kissmyass.com. <laughs> Moving right on. All right, we just lost half our listeners. <laughs> half our, half our listeners right, right. They, that one guy is probably half our listeners. Yeah, there you go. All right, so ne- what's up next? All right, so we're going to go on to the feature here because it's going to be a long one. It's going to be a doozy, and you're going to absolutely love this. All right, so we're going to do uh, the Executioner, uh, which is often referred to as Mac Bolan. It's probably one of the biggest inspirations on the men's action adventure line. I love statistics. So here are a few for you to preface this discussion. So think about this. There are 400 and ex- 460 Executioner titles in the series. There's another 178 giant-sized Bolin novels, which are typically called Super Bolins. Uh, counting the Super Editions, there are another 53 novels in the spinoff series Able Team. Uh, counting Supers, there are, uh, i got it written down here, 54 books in another spinoff series called Phoenix Force. We've got 140 books that I was able to locate online, 140 books in the spinoff series Stony Man. You've got another eight Executioner comic books and a graphic novel. The graphic novel, I believe, was written by uh, Don Pendleton's wife, Linda. We'll get into that a little later. Uh, Four issues of Don Pendleton's The Executioner Mystery Magazine. So doing the math here, uh, Tom, we're at almost 900 installments in the Mac Bolan literary universe. Did you include Stony Man in that? Yeah, we got so yeah we okay. got Stony Man yeah right, yeah because some of the Stony Mans have Mac Bolin some of the Stony Mans are just the Able Team and the Phoenix Force but it's the same universe you're right it literally took me about a half hour to try to piece all this together and Wikipedia and the MacBolin.com website is pretty resourceful as well but I didn't know there'd be math on this podcast oh my gosh so who is Mac Bolin uh, I'm going to quickly work through the origin before we expand upon the series as a whole uh, so we're going to go to uh, way back to March of 1969 it's the first Executioner novel which is called War Against the Mafia. It was released by Pinnacle. The character and the series was created by Don Pendleton. Uh, The debut novel is really uh, the the essential origin tale, uh, which is ultimately what it is. Uh, In the opening pages, we are introduced to the 30-year-old Mac Bolin. Uh, At this time, he's a U.S. Army sergeant. He's serving in the Vietnam War. He's on, a, uh, I guess, a second tour uh, after 12 years of military service. As a skilled sniper, he holds an official record of killing 32 high-ranking North Vietnamese officers, 46 Viet Cong leaders, and 17 Viet Cong uh, village leaders. So he's uh, pretty masterful at, uh, at executing. Thus the, his name, perhaps? <laughs> there you go. Uh, through a series of letters, we learn that Bolin and his mother Elsa communicate twice a week, and she even sends some care packages. Uh, Bolin has two siblings, 17-year-old Cindy, and 14-year-old Johnny. His father is Sam, a steel worker, and a man that Bolin considers, uh, I'm going to quote, as indestructible as the steel he made. Elsa explains in a letter that Bolin's father had a heart attack, and due to lost wages, the family's in a bind financially. So one day, uh, Bolin gets summoned to the base camp chaplain's office. So we know where this is going. He's informed that his father, his mother, his sister, they're all dead and that his brother is in critical condition. So Bolin, uh, he goes on emergency leave, and uh, he's going to fly stateside back to Pennsylvania, where the family's at. He learns that his father had borrowed money from a mob-run loan shark. So uh, Sam had, I think, borrowed $400. He ends up paying back $550, including interest, but was told he would continue to pay for the foreseeable future. Uh, Under the financial stress, Sam cracks and fatally shoots his wife, daughter, and himself, leaving his son critically wounded. Uh, There's not a lot of, there's not really a lot of appearances here with Johnny uh, in the early books. Uh, Johnny's featured at the beginning of this book, and then we really don't see him again for a while. 
Uh, there's a number of iconic and pivotal moments in the back Mac Bolin universe, but in my opinion, uh, the one that really stands out is the one that's at the very beginning of this book or in the opening chapters. He purchases a Marlin 444 rifle. He camps out in front of the Lone Shark office, which is called Triangle Industrial. He then shoots and kills five of the, uh, I guess, the corrupt employees that are working there and sets off a rampage that's going to last for decades. Like many of the early novels, uh, Bolden infiltrates the mob. Uh, he's going to work from within, typically ending in uh, this, this uh, I don't know, violent crescendo after coming clean and then uh, eh, cleaning house. There's a really cool Bolin quote in the first book. In fact, I wrote it down here. Let me see. Uh, he says, Life is a competition, and I am a competitor. I have the tools and the skills, and I must accept the responsibilities. I will fight the battle, spill the blood, smear myself with it, and stand at the bar of judgment to be crushed and chewed and ingested by those I serve. It is the way of the world. It is the ultimate disposition. Stand ready, mafiosi. The executioner is here. And I might have said mafiosi wrong. What is that? Mafiosi? Mafi- you say mafiosi, I say mafiosi. <laughs> yeah, potato, potato. There you go. Um, by most standards, the first four books of the series are really considered the, uh, I guess, the building blocks of the series. 37 of the first 38 novels are all written by Don Pendleton and are considered the, uh, the Mafia Wars. But Tom, before I, I move on to, uh, I guess, the next... Uh, the next stage of the of the series, which is after um, after the first thirty eight novels, you've got a little bit further experience with the series. I don't know. Tell tell us a little bit more about the uh, you know the rights holders. Like how does this thing go down with the publishers, and also that there's a non a non Don Pendleton book thrown in there too, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, it's weird. This is this little side story that people in the uh, Bolin fandom are, are a bit obsessed with. Is that in it? So. Don Pendleton writes War Against the Mafia. It's, he's got a huge hit on their hands. Pinnacle Books is the publisher. After you know, 15, 13, 14 books in there, uh, Pinnel, Pinnacle and Pendleton start fighting. And this isn't unusual. Down the road, there was litigation between them. But uh, Pinnacle, I guess, felt that they were going to be so obstinate about it. In 1973, they brought in another author to write Executioner number 16, Sicilian Slaughter. And that's the only executioner book that's not published under Don Pendleton's name, right? He wrote some of them. Others were ghostwritten later. Eric will talk about that. But there's this weird anomaly in there where executioner number 16, Sicilian Slaughter, is by Jim Peterson. Now, Jim Peterson, um, the guy writing as Jim Peterson, was a guy named William Crawford, who, um, and the book was a disaster. Uh, it, It totally spit in the face of Pendleton's vision for the Bolin character. Bolin uh, kills a cop, kills a woman, does things which which he just hadn't done. Now, this at the time, this William Crawford guy was being groomed for big things by Pinnacle. Pinnacle thought they had this new golden boy on their hands, and they launched a series by William Crawford named the Striker series. That's S-T-R-Y-K-E-R, which is absolutely terrible, and you reviewed one of them on the site, right? And it's a real stinker. I've got the uh, Striker number one coming out to the paperbackwarrior.com site in the coming weeks, and it is god-awful. He also wrote a Western that I reviewed on the site called Ranger Kirk uh, under the name uh, the clever pseudonym William C. Period Rawford, not knowing like who's that fooling. And then it, on the first page, he dedicates it to like some other person by the name of Crawford. Anyway, it's just terrible. So smash cut to years later, um, Linda Pendleton remains the right ho- rights holder of the 38 first um, executioner novels. Linda is an author unto herself, very kind woman. I've communicated with her on Facebook. And she is the widow of Don Pendleton. And she runs the estate very well. She makes sure that the first 38 books, minus number 16, are available to the fans at reasonable prices even today. Um, Linda told me through a Facebook group that Don didn't like the book. He considered it to be badly written. He didn't regard it to be part of the series. Linda still owns the rights, but it's no longer part of the reprint package. So it's not available anymore. You have to find an old used copy. I think the result of that has ended up being worth a little more than the other copies because it hasn't been reprinted that much. But And I haven't read it by, by all accounts by people who are Mac Boland fans that the book is just absolutely terrible. And if it was written by William Crawford, that seems like it's probably right. It's uh, considered non-canon, right? They they don't right. It's it's exactly exactly the things that occurred in that novel are not considered part of the Bolin canon, and Linda Pendleton's in a position to decide what that is because she's the rights holder, at least to the first thirty-eight. 
Yeah, and you know, and I hate to to belittle William Crawford's work, but you know, I, that's not my intention. I've only read one book by him. It was Striker. It was terrible. Um, Tom obviously read Ranger Kirk and didn't like that. So maybe William Crawford's a really good writer, but based on these three novels, that it doesn't seem to be the case. But uh, I'd like to try to find another William Crawford book that maybe I do like. But the the transition in the series occurred in 1981 when Pendleton sold the series rights to Gold Eagle, which I think is it's part of Harlequin, which is actually owned by. I don't know, but Harlequin was a big company at the time and a publisher of, of most people romance novels. And so I used to think it was very funny in the 1980s where all these construction workers with Mac Bolin books <laughs> in their back pocket are actually reading Harlequins just like their wives are. But uh, I don't know who the parent company is of Harlequin. Yeah, I think um, I think it's Harper Collins, uh, at least based on Wikipedia. But there's a whole there's a whole list of subsidiaries under Harper Collins. But I think I think Old Eagle is listed under there. But uh, installment number 39 is called the New War. And it's really called that for a reason. The Executioner logo is minimal at the at the top, and it's got a more bold, red-lettered Mac Bolden logo that becomes present for this one and a lengthy number of books before the Executioner logo returns back to the center stage and becomes a little bit more prominent on the book covers. The New War is written by a guy named Saul Wernick, and it has the, uh, the Fugitive, which is Mac Bolden, uh, on the run from CIA and various task force, and he's now aligning with the uh, U.S. law enforcement. This sets the table for what the rest of the series is like, which is essentially Bolin fighting internationally against human traffickers. Uh, he's fighting terrorists, uh, yeah, various drug cartels, and really just criminal empires uh, globally. So after, uh, after Pendleton, uh, which actually I'm going to stop for a second, because after Don Pendleton, he had a specific... Um, requirement when he sold his rights to uh, to Gold Eagle. What was that requirement? Okay, this is great. And it was such an innovation and it's made our lives so easy, so much easier today, years later, in trying to dissect who wrote what. And what Don Pendleton wanted to do is he wanted to give the actual authors of these books credit, which turned the world on its head as far as the idea of house names. And he did that because on the copyright page of every single Executioner novel, with uh, with a few exceptions... It says special thanks to, you know, Michael Newton, Stephen Mertz for their contribution to this novel, which is a huge deal because now we have the ability to unlock who wrote the actual book, which means that if you're a fan of Chet Cunningham, for example, you can go very quickly figure out which executioner novels were written by Chet Cunningham. And Don Pendleton's insistence on that was spread throughout all the Gold Eagle series and all the Gold Eagle books. Decades later, you find you had an opportunity to find out who actually wrote these books, which for cultural pulp fiction anthropologists like you and I is just such a great crutch. The amount of time I spend trying to figure out who wrote some of these books is disproportionate to the book's quality. I wish I had the time back that I've invested trying to find out who wrote the Killmaster novels. Yeah, oh, forget about it. Well, actually, <laughs> Wikipedia is a good source for the ah. Carter Killmaster. They have them all listed there. But, um, but okay. so that one's a little easier. But some of these old ones, forget about it. You'll never figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Well, after Pendleton, uh, it's a revolving door of authors, and they all take their turns at telling these, uh, these bowling stories. Here's a list of some of the biggest contributors to the series. These are some great names. Uh, Stephen Mertz with 11. Mike Newton did 78 Peter Leslie did eight. Chet Cunningham did six. Uh, 23 were written by Dan Schmidt. Uh, another 23 by Mike McQuay. 18 by a guy named Mel Odom. 32 by Jerry Van Cook. 25 by Chuck Rogers. 16 by Mike Lineker. Uh, nine by David Robbins. So it's a, a, quite a bit of uh, Bolins right there written by those guys. There's also this really cool 1977 standalone piece uh, called Executioner War Book. And according to Linda Pendleton, it was a collaborative effort um, stemming from, I guess, Pinnacle Editorial. And it had uh, Stephen Mertz, Mike Newton, Don Pendleton's son Greg, and daughter Melinda doing the research and putting the book together. The book has some letters written by fans to the author, as well as drawings of the battle van and firearms. Uh, quickly, I'll move through a couple of the other um, things with the Mac Bolin universe. Uh, in June of 1982, the spinoff series Able Team and Phoenix Force were launched. I won't spend a lot of time on this again. It's uh, It may be a feature later down the road. But the general idea was to take some of Bolin's uh, allies and put them together on combat teams. 
And I think the uh, the origin of this I, this kind of idea was probably the 1969 installment. Uh, I think that was Executioner number two. It's called Death Squad. And I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at what was in the 50s and 60s, but that might have been one of the very few um, team-based combat books. Well, also some of the dudes from Death Squad, if I'm not mistaken, become characters, members of Able Team and or Phoenix Force. Right, exactly. That's yeah. correct. Um, and then beginning in 1983, they had the Stony Man Doctrine uh, book come out. This is the very first Stony Man book, and it really uh, incorporated all of the uh, the various books. So you've got Mac Bolan, You've got Able Team, um, Phoenix Force. They're all operating out of a uh, CIA training ground uh, in Northern Virginia called Stony Man Farm, and uh, that, that that series basically is is concentrating on hunting down uh, various KGB and and spies and things like that. It gets really international, a lot of espionage and spy stuff, but still incorporating the the violent uh, tendencies of of what Mac Bolan's about. Um, and that was, you know, the Stony Man series would actually run until 2008, even though Able Team and Phoenix Force came to an end in 1991. Uh, cleverly, in 1984, the publisher came out with a giant size Bolin, and these were double the size of your regular Executioner books, but had a higher price tag of $3.95. So they got a little bit more money out of it. Uh, the Super Bolins ran all the way through 2015. Now, I've reviewed a. Uh, I reviewed a really cool Super Bowl one, and I think it was maybe number four. It came out in 1985. Anyway, it's called Dirty War. Um, and what Stephen Mertz did with this, uh, now Stephen Mertz was a Pendleton protege. Uh, he's gone on to write a, a lot of really cool uh, books, including his uh, MIA Hunter series. But he did a retcon, and retcon is, is famous in the comic books where they'll go back and, and not really change an origin story, but give us a little bit of info on what happened before the famous origin story. So in this case, he goes back in time and revisits the original Death Squad members from Execution Number 2, and he shows us how Bolin, as Master Sergeant in Vietnam, used that squad to hunt the North Vietnamese uh, in the Vietnam War. Uh, so this is before War Against the Mafia, um, and this book showed us Mac Bolin uh, prior to getting on the plane to go to Vietnam and how he was interacting with his family. So it covers a lot of ground prior to War Against the Mafia. Again, it was written in 1985, but really is a, is a cool, clever concept, and I'm glad Mertz did that. You can find my review on paperbackwarrior.com for that book. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's the whole the whole universe and it's sort of a sky-level view there's plenty of characters, there's a lot of trilogy stories, there's ongoing battles, um, there's other elements for you to really explore. I, I don't know, I feel like I could spend a whole lifetime just you know, just digging into the Bolin mythology. Uh, oh, and I'll also say, across all pop culture, uh, and this is, this is really popular when you look at the Executioner stuff out on Facebook, uh, it leaves its mark for sure because there's no denying that Marvel Comics' The Punisher is a direct descendant of the character. Uh, and really cool, I found this online. In June of 1993, Advanced Comics interviewed Don Pendleton about the comparisons between the Punisher and the Executioner. And in it, Pendleton states, uh, quote, Let's just say the Punisher has taken a lot of liberties with my work. Anyone who knows the history of the Executioner has known that all along. I elected many years ago to just let it pass, feeling that there is room for both of us in the industry, close quote. He goes on to point out in the interview how Marvel's character took tremendous liberties like the War Journal, uh, that War Wagon uh, thing. You can read the whole interview and the uh, article, which thankfully Linda Pendleton put together, and it's online at donpendleton.com. And I'm also going to state for the record that the Bo the Bolin book covers, uh, which are really cool, are really uh, some of the finest in the entire industry. Uh, Gil Cohen painted a lot of covers, and I'd speculate that uh, you know a lot of the buyers, the fans gravitate to his covers as opposed to the really generic ones that came out much later, which are just hideous. Yeah. Uh, on the website menspulpmags.com, our friend and paperback warrior supporter Bob has a terrific interview with uh, Gil about his work. On that same page, Linda Pendleton states, and I'm going to quote again, when I visualize Don Pendleton's Mac Bolin, I see Bolin as Gil Cohen portrayed him. First on the covers of the Executioner novels Don wrote that were published by Pinnacle, 
then on the numerous covers Gill did for the series and its spinoffs published by Gold Eagle. Uh, I, don't know, I think I got it all here. Oh, last couple things before I forget. There was talk in the 80s of Burt Reynolds adapting the executioner to film, and it would star Sylvester Stallone you know, from Rambo, Rocky, and female martial arts star Cynthia Rothrick. Uh, that failed. And since then, I guess there's been a lot of fighting for Linda Pendleton to try to get a movie made. Uh, she continues to stay pretty dedicated to that cause. And I'm going to take a moment and say thanks to Linda Pendleton for her endless dedication to this series, the character, the fans. Um, she's really approachable when it comes to Mac Bolan. So questions, things like that. She seems like very approachable. Um, her work is definitely appreciated by readers like myself. Hey, can I give a plug for my favorite non-Pendleton uh, Mac Bolan book? Yes, please. All right, so War Against the Mafia is a central reading. It's not only one of the best books in this genre, it's one of the best books I've ever read. It's just a fantastic novel. But my favorite Mac Bolan book not written by Don Pendleton is Executioner number 91 called The Trial by Michael Newton. The idea is that Bolin is finally arrested after for a crime that he didn't commit this time, but they figure out it's him. It's Mac Bolin, this international fugitive, and um, and he actually goes to trial and has to defend himself and testifies on the stand. And, uh, and his testimony was just some of the best ideas as far as um, creating a philosophy to Bolin's war. He does this amazing monologue in it written by Michael Newton, who was also one of the protégés of Don Pendleton. He and Steve Mertz basically learned how to write executioners from the master himself. And I just remember this one line that still haunts me from the Mac Bolin uh, trial. He says, you know, I'm not the judge. I'm the judgment. And I just love that. It comes back to me all the time. So anyway, that's my plug. You guys should check that out. It's the Mac Bolin series known as the Executioner series by Don Pendleton. All right. Awesome. So I'm going to do one review here, and then I'm going to hand it over to Tom to do his review. But mine is Baltimore Trackdown, which is Executioner number 88. And it was written by uh, Chet Cunningham and released by Gold Eagle in 1986. Uh, Cunningham contributed to uh, a number of Mac Bolan volumes, like I mentioned earlier, but his 79th installment is called, uh, let's see, Council of Kings, and that includes characters that are going to later appear in this Baltimore trackdown. Uh, you really don't need to read these books in order, uh, but sometimes they have stories that'll cross up a little bit. This one is really cool. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but my review will be out there on uh, the website. But uh, you've got a mob kingpin named Carlo uh, Nazarione. I'm terrible with this stuff. Carlo Nazarione has infiltrated the uh, Baltimore Police Department. Uh, he's basically going out and, um, and buying up the police department so he can uh, do a lot of different uh, criminal uh, elements into the, uh, into the city, including gambling, illegal gambling. Uh, he, uh, buys the captain, which his name is Harley Davis. <laughs> it's just kind of silly. Uh, <laughs> sure it's on the tip of his tongue. Yeah. yeah. But he buys him and, uh, he really kind of just goes out and buys the rest of the cops, right? Well, Leo Turin, which is an old, uh, Mac Bolin, uh, ally, he's planted a, uh, an informant in the ranks at the police department. And that informant spills some, uh, info to Leo, who then gives it to Bolin and lets him go to town. So Bolin goes after the uh, the cops, the bad cops, and he goes after the mob in Baltimore. And he does it in the typical early Don Pendleton way where he's uh, knocking over you know, gambling halls, bars. Um, it's really a familiar sort of landscape that we've seen Mac Bolin in before. But Chet Cunningham writes it so well. But as good as the first 114 pages are, it really... It really goes to town when it gets into the second half of the book, which is kind of like its own standalone little story. Because in this one, there's a hitman named Vince Carboni, who was originally in that uh, Chet Cunningham book, uh, Council of Kings. He had some unfinished work in that book, and he had had a skirmish with Mac Bolan. So he shows up out of the blue uh, on page 115. And he basically corners Mac Bolin in a, uh, in a, in a farm up in uh, Upper State, Maryland. And in the farm, he's, he's got the high ground. He's got a, uh, uh, a hunting rifle. Uh, I, think, I think it's a 30 out 6 And he's up in the farmhouse, and Bolin is trapped down into the, uh, the farm. So it's a really cool cat-and-mouse game that they play for 70 pages, surprisingly enough. And uh, 
Boland's going from building to building and shed to shed, and he really has nothing other than his auto mag. Uh, but it's a great, it's a really great little side story in this that that sort of completes the Council of Kings story from earlier. But it, in a lot of ways, and I mentioned this in my review, it reminded me of, um, oh gosh, what is the. Uh, I'm losing track of it now. The Don't Shoot the Piano Player. What was that called? David Goodis. Yeah, it was called Down Down There, wasn't oh, it? Oh, Down There, yeah. Yeah, in that book, there's a really cool uh, finale where it, it has a firefight just like this in a farm with uh, the criminals in the upper window of the farmhouse. I think Chad Cunningham had obviously read that book and used a little bit of that for this. But uh, it's a great book. I highly recommend picking up. These these paperbacks are are fairly popular. You can find them everywhere. They're in the mainstream. They're cheap. But this is definitely one to get if you're looking for a non-Pendleton book. Uh, and that's really all I have for that. All right. We're running a little long, so I'll be quick about this one. I want to review a new book from an old series. The book I want to review is The Gunsmith Number 446, Deadville, by Robert Randizi, who writes these gunsmith books as J.R. Roberts. A little bit of background. The, these are adult westerns, which means that they are action-packed, fun westerns with very, very graphic sex scenes embedded in them. This was a very successful genre that launched in the 1970s and 80s uh, that really had four series that kind of rose above the others to become extremely popular. Slocum, Long Arm, Trailsman, and Gunsmith. Gunsmith is the only one that is still around, and it's the one that's also the most consistently good thanks to having only one author and visionary at the helm, rather than a rotating cast of hired guns writing under a house name like the others did. And that's Robert Randizi. The book star, a kind of drifter hero by the name of Clint Adams, who is a uh, whose nickname is The Gunsmith, um, he has achieved, by the time this book comes out, folk hero status. Everybody in the Wild West knows about The Gunsmith which is significant. In Deadville, what happens is the mayor of Wentworth, this real a-hole by the name of Tom Simon, um, <laughs> um, in Wentworth, Nebraska, hatches a scheme to make his town into a boom town. And his idea is this, that the, the towns of Tombstone and Deadwood have become tourist attractions because of very famous murders that have taken place there. Wild Bill Hickok was killed in Deadwood. And so his idea is to lure Clint Adams to Wentworth kill him, have him murdered, and then change the town name to Deadville because this very famous kind of roaming hero of the Wild West was killed there. And so Clint Adams comes to the town, and it's really very much a mystery because Randizi is a very famous mystery writer, former head of the Private Eye Writers Association, and Clint Adams is trying to figure out what's going on. It's a very quick read. It's, it's dialogue-driven. That's ran, the way Randizi writes. So it has short chapters, and a lot of them are just dialogue between the characters, between the action and sex scenes. And to me, it's just amazing that he can still come up with fresh stories after all this time. 446 installations of this book, all written by him, and generally pretty good. This one I liked especially. So I'd recommend it. It's a new book. You can find it on Amazon.com. And please take a look at the review on paperbackwarrior.com. And I think that brings us to the conclusion of another episode. Like always, we've got another batch of five reviews this week on the website, including a classic Western that you will love. And we're going to be back with another exciting episode next week. Again, thank you for listening. So long, friends.